All right, if you take your Bibles this morning, <clears throat> if you turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4, we're going to look at verses 1 through 5. The title of the message this morning is The Last Charge. The Last Charge. 2 Timothy chapter 4, starting at verse 1. He says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his peering in his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray you bless the message now. Uh, I pray, Heavenly Father, that uh, I might be able to uh, have everyone here this morning see the, the heresy that's spreading through the church, the, um, the fact that folks are not in, cannot endure hearing sound doctrine anymore and that the church is falling flat on its face and has been falling for years. And I pray, Father, that you'd help us to stand for the truth, help us to believe the Bible, help us not to be moved from our place. And I pray you just bless now the preaching for Jesus' sake. Amen. There's a couple things he says there in those first five verses. He says one of the things that pops out at me is the time will come. Uh, I don't know, maybe everybody wants to look through rose-colored glasses. Maybe it make you feel better, uh, but the time has come when people will not endure sound doctrine. You know, we're not in the beginnings of Laodicea, we're at the zenith of Laodicea. Uh, the folks are, are, are no longer believing the truth, they're starting to fall away, and they're starting to fall away in Bible-believing camps. And this thing is starting to make its way through, and we're going to talk a little bit about that this morning. Uh, it says there, they will not endure sound doctrine. This is the falling away that's mentioned in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It says, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed. So the first thing that's going to happen is a falling away. I don't know why nobody's accepting it or looking at it or seeing it. We're in the middle of it or in the height of it. We have a falling away. The church is on its face. And we're going to find out that what that deals with is doctrine. They're still inviting folks to church. They're still having people come. They're still saying, open your hymnal and turn to this number and they're singing the hymns. Well, now they're into praise songs and all that nonsense. But it's, it, the issue is doctrine. Why? They don't believe God anymore. That's what they've gotten away from. But there's still plenty of churches out there, some bigger than ever. But do they believe the truth anymore? And, and listen, I, I'm telling you, I, I, I understand this. You can explain to someone through the, with the scriptures, take them verse by verse through it, and show them countless things that you're thinking, this should convince anyone, and they'll look at you like they have no clue. That's got to be the spirit of this age. You know, it's like, it's like I say about tattoos, you know. The reason a Christian doesn't want to get a tattoo, number one is the Lord's waiting with a Brillo pad to take it off of you when you get to glory. The second reason is it's the spirit of this age that's going to put one here and one there. And I know that's not for us, but why are you following the trend? It's a good reason, amen? But it says they'll not endure sound doctrine. So no matter what I say here tonight, there's going to be a lot of people that aren't convinced no matter what you tell them. It says they'll turn away their ears from the truth. They don't want or love the truth. Now, that's a, there, there's a, is an oxymoron, what they say that is. Because the Bible says that charity rejoiceth in the truth. How can you love God and not love the truth? Hey, you can't even worship God without the truth. When he says, I seek those to worship me in spirit, that's someone who's saved, Romans 8, and in truth. You've got to have both them things. And how are you going to do that without that? How are you going to worship God uh, believing a bunch of lies? Won't work. You know, the thing about the Lord is He doesn't care what you feel about the truth. The truth is the truth. 
He didn't care if it rubs your neighbor the wrong way. He didn't care if it rubs you the wrong way. The truth is the truth. When I got saved, I asked for one thing from God. I said, just give me the truth. Just give me the truth. It's raked me over the coals ever since. But I still want the truth. Sometimes it testifies against me. But I still want it. Rather than be blinded by some stupid lie, I'd rather have the truth. It says they shall be turned unto fables. Now for the lost, uh, their fables evolution. You know, what's Dr. Rugman call that? A uh, fairy tale for adults. <laughs> That's the truth too, man. You've got to be half insane to believe that. But you know what? you just just about got to be insane to believe post-millennial doctrine. Now here's what I'm talking about. The millennium is the thousand-year reign of Christ. When he comes back, he establishes that thousand-year reign of Christ, comes back at the end of the tribulation. They have done away with all that. And a post-millennialist believes that after the thousand years, or after some certain era, whoever you happen to be reading, Jesus Christ is going to come back at that point. And that, now get this, <laughs> the church is actually bringing in a golden era or golden age. Wow, you're doing a lousy job. <laughs> Regardless of the sound doctrine that you read in the Bible, that it, I, don't know how, I don't know how a Bible believer could even believe it. And at one time, this was... Uh, it might have been well represented, but World War I and World War II came along. You know, death camps and uh, pogroms and all kinds of things happened in this world. And, and they, they, they canned that doctrine and said, there's no way that could be real. We're not heading toward anything golden. And now it's resurfaced and a lot of Christians are jumping on the bandwagon. And they're jumping on it because, listen, it fits their lifestyle. He it says it's because of their lust that they do this. They want something in this world and, they, and they, don't want, they don't want their Lord to deprive them of it. Let me tell you something. You may get deprived. Jesus Christ was deprived of a lot of things. I don't know why we think we're too good to be deprived of some things. Now there are five things, major things, or maybe some more, but these are the major ones I thought of, that this doctrine, uh, and it's a pathetic one, that teaches it eliminates the literal interpretation of Scripture. You can rip out three-fifths of your Bible and throw it in the trash because they have to spiritualize everything. There are promises back there to a people, the nation of Israel, and you've got to get rid of them. So just take three-fifths of your Bible and tear it out and throw it in the waste can. They eliminate the rapture of the church, which I take personally. Personal offense. <laughs> Don't try to mess with the rapture. <laughs> uh, they get rid of the rapture. They get rid of the judgment seat of Christ. Of course, they get rid of Israel's place in Scripture, and they get rid of the premillennial return of Jesus Christ. And as a result of that, three-fifths of your Bible goes in the trash can. You don't even need it because they're going to spiritualize in it any, everything in it every, or spiritualize everything anyway. Yeah, I think about the little interpretation of Scripture, you know, and and, and you know. Folks just beat you to death. Well, this is uh, allegorical and this is figurative. You know, when you all came in, I said, take a seat. Nobody headed out the door with their chair, you know. <laughs> I've called somebody. I said, you were bright. And I wasn't talking about a light bulb on your head, you know. Uh, you, you know when, when Jesus Christ says, I am the door, we know he's not a wood door. You know what he means. Now, why are you messing around with God and acting like, you know, literal? you're just messing with that book? You know, I think it's because they do know what he means. <laughs> anyway, now here's some reasons why this teaching is nonsense. I mean, absolute nonsense to believe that we, the church, are going to bring in a golden age and that Jesus Christ is going to wait for, they say, some say a thousand, some say it could be shorter, some say it could be longer, indefinite. You know, that's, that's why I say they keep bouncing around. But he's not coming back till way long from now. There's no, if there is tribulation, it's spread out over the length of the church. I don't know who the Antichrist is. Pick one. If you want to say Barack Obama, that's fine with me. That's what, you know, you might as well just pick, it could be your neighbor. You know, who knows? Um, this thing leaves open. Listen, when you start spiritualizing that book, you can teach literally anything. Anything. All right. 
Um, here's some reasons why it's nonsense. Number one, because of the failure of man. Every dispensation in the Bible ends apostasy and failure, bar none. Because it takes Jesus Christ literally coming back to this earth to make it work. And even then, he's got some trouble by the end of the millennium. From folks, not from him. <laughs> but every dispensation in, ended in apostasy and failure. From the garden to the, to the present. You know why? Man fails. And you know, man has no higher estimation of himself than man. That's the problem. And we're left to himself, he will fail Every time. Scripture, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Turn there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. Because, listen, to believe what they're saying, that we're bringing in this golden age, where we're bringing in this time of spiritual awakening, where a majority, and this is what they're teaching. Well, I forgot to read you the definition of it. Let me read that to you. It's also known as Christian Reconstruction. You know, you've got to retitle something so people buy it. It says that Jesus Christ will not return to after the thousand years is expired, if indeed it is a thousand years. Post-millennialists post -millennialist expect that eventually the vast majority of men living will be saved. Increasing gospel success will gradually produce a time in history prior to Christ's return in which faith, righteousness, peace, and prosperity will, pre will prevail in the affairs of men and of nations. After an exten extensive era of such conditions, Jesus Christ will return visibly, bodily, and gloriously to end history with the general resurrection and the final judgment after which the eternal orders follows. The golden age of Christianity before Christ return. That's their... And I'm like, not seeing it. <laughs> Not seeing it at all. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. This know also that in the last days, these be the last days, the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. This sound like the bunch that you think is going to bring in the golden age? Going to bring in the kingdom? Because you're not only going to have to transform. We're not talking about just a bunch of churches having a good time. We're talking about the political landscape changing. We're talking about nations moving toward the Bible, toward Jesus Christ. That's what they're saying. Anybody seeing that? Anybody? Are we moving toward or away from that book? How can you believe that? I'm looking at my, are you insane? What's wrong with you? You go off your meds? What? How can you believe something that ridiculous? If it's not just the failure of man, how about the failure of the church? Because your Bible records that also. Two places make this abundantly clear in Scripture. 2 Thessalonians 2.3 it says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, and that day is the day of Christ, which involves the rapture, the judgment seat of Christ, the marriage supper of the Lamb, and eventually the advent. And it says, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now the word there for uh, falling away, for anybody interested in a Greek word, is the word apostasy. If you spell it out in Greek and put English letters to it, it's apostasy. Man, that's happened. He said, listen, he didn't say before the day of Christ comes, there'll be a great awakening and golden era. He said, before it comes, the church is going to be flat on its face. And that's where it's at. It is flat on its face. They surrendered the book. They surrendered the doctrines. They have no stand. And because of that, the church is on its back flailing and, and has no credibility in this world anymore. Now, if you think, now, hold it now. Maybe you think that fellow came over here to visit about a month ago. Maybe you think that's where it's at. Funny thing about that is, you know, it says over there in Revelation 17 and 18, 
that fellow's connected with the city. You know I'm talking about the Pope, man. Uh, who else came here? Somebody else? Oh, no, not here. He wouldn't stay long if he came here. He wouldn't like it. When that fellow showed up, you know, maybe they got all their hope in him. thing is, that fellow is connected with a city that the Bible talks about over there in Revelation 17, 18. It sits on seven hills, whose colors are purple and scarlet, and whose um, sign or um, emblem is a golden cup. And it says that uh, it says he's connected with a he's connected with a a, a beast or a, a a dragon, or she is. Anyway, I got a little ahead of myself there. Anyway, let me go on here. Revelation chapter three. So we know from Second Thessalonians two three that. Um, there's going to be a falling away. Revelation 3, verse 14 to 21. It says unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, I have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed. Those two things speak, that gold speaks of doctrine and that white raiment speaks of personal righteousness. That thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. That's all about being led of the Spirit, being able to see things. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. So you think this is the church that's going to bring in the golden age? Got a few problems with that. This is, listen, out of the seven... This is the worst. It's the worst of the whole bunch. And we're in it. We're in that Laodicean age. You know what's so unbelievable about believing uh, the doctrine of postmillennialism based upon that verse? Jesus Christ is outside of the door of the church knocking to get in. That's the one that's bringing it in? The one where we've kicked him out? How can that be? I saw something this morning. I never, I, I, I never saw that before. It just, it kind of hit me that before this thing's over with, I might find myself outside the door, but at least I'm standing with my Savior, and we're both knocking. Yeah, I mean, I'll have some company, Lord willing, but at least it says they're standing. I'll let this church die before I start changing the doctrine. We just shut her down and go home. You know that, and I mean it. I didn't come this long to compromise because I want to keep some big thing going. This ain't that big. <laughs> and I don't need to keep it going. God don't keep it going. That's it. We've expected the fat lady to sing here I don't know how many times. Last week we had 11 visitors. The fat lady left. So I never know. I just like, I don't know, Lord. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm getting ready thinking, okay, i got to do this. I have to maybe see where am I going to go and what job am I I'm all figuring all kinds. And then it just goes, it just keeps going. It just keeps going. And praise the Lord for that. But we're not going to make it go. And we're not going to change things to, because they can't endure it. They can leave. Stay home. If you don't want the truth, you don't want to, you don't want to be here because we've got nothing else to offer you. A little coffee in the back, maybe a donut every now and then. But that's it. There's no basketball courts, juice bar, or anything else. You'll just get what you get. But if you love the truth, I tell you what, it'll be enough for you. Amen. Always was enough for me. Uh, not only because of the, uh, the failure of the church, but because of the example in Scripture. Uh, Hebrews 11.5, it says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. It was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. You know, 
You know, if you say the word rapture, you know, immediately some clown comes back and says, well, that's not a Bible word. Well, neither is the word trinity. But I believe that too, man. You know, but you do have the word translation right there. And one day Enoch was out there just uh, a fellowship with God. God said, come on, I'm, I'm going I'm to have you out for the day. And of course, the day never ends up there. So he took Enoch, and Enoch's been with him ever since. You realize that's the prototype for a Christian being raptured? And, and the fact that Enoch was raptured before the trouble came in Genesis with the great flood? That's a picture of the church going out. That's a picture of someone alive going out and never... I've told you, we may be that generation. I started working out because I want to make it. I want to cheat death so bad. I want the Lord to blow the trumpet and get out of here and be like Enoch to never experience physical death. Wouldn't that be awesome? Now, I might step out next week and get hit by a bus. At least I'll make it. Amen? But I, I, that, would be, that would be a great thing to, to escape physical death. You say, well, Enoch had a testimony that he pleased God. I thought you said the church was on his back flame. Yeah, we're talking about all the church. The church as a whole, Jesus Christ is pleased with it. Now, he's got a few wrinkles and spots, and he'll take care of that. But one of these days, man, he's going to blow the trumpet, and out we go. Uh, you know what Enoch says over there, and uh, he prophesies over there in Jude, uh, verse 14, only one chapter in that book. It's the book just before the book of Revelation. It says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. I would think someone that believes in post-millennialism would have a problem with that. Because how are you going to come with him if you're still here? I didn't, you, you've got to go before you're coming back. That, that makes sense to me, you know. i got to be there before I can leave and come back down here. But it says he comes with ten thousands of his saints. Okay. You see the problem. But not only because of the example in Scripture, but because the order of the books in the Bible are premillennial. They're laid out premillennial. Here's what I mean by premillennial. Premillennial is that Jesus Christ will come back bodily to this world at the end of the seven years of tribulation and set up a 1,000 year reign. Will you see him? You'll see him. If you're saved, you're coming back with him anyway. But if you're here, every, it says every eye shall see. I don't know if we're going to spiritualize that, you know. You know, you start spiritualizing everything. Sometimes I wonder, am I really alive? No, I'm serious. Sometimes I think that I'm hooked to some kind of battery. And I'm, I'm in this alien grocery store in the frozen food section. And they're allowing me to live out this life. This is all just an illusion. You're not really there. And I'm just, living out this, uh, I'm just living out this life of going through. They're just trying to keep me, keep me down so that when somebody has a pallet for me, you know, they just take me out of the frozen food section and my life ends when they eat me. You say, that's absolutely crazy. But that's just as crazy to believe that. When you think you're going to bring in something, you're not bringing in nothing. We need to get out of here. We need out of here so bad Some of you look at me, did he really say that? <laughs> some of you think you're a sim in somebody's computer, some simulation, you know, or you're just a program and all, one of these days they're going to terminate. People come up with all kinds of crazy things, you know. That Bible is a lot more literal than you think it is. And where it can be taken, where it should be taken figuratively and allegorically, it usually tells you. Let us look at the orders. Turn to the front of your Bible to the uh, index. <clears throat> and the Old and New Testament are laid out premillennially. Premillennially. That's kind of hard to say. Premillennial. That is, Jesus Christ will come back and set up his kingdom for a thousand years. The church, uh, well, the church is actually taken out first. Seven years later, he returns, or about that. And let's look at, let's just, I'm going to try to bunch this up. I don't want to go through every book and explain, but from Genesis to 2 Chronicles, you see that? Go down through there all the way to 2 Chronicles. 
It deals with a lot of the history of Israel. You have the calling out, establishing, apostasy, and captivity of the children of Israel in all those books. When you get to Second Chronicles, uh, both of the uh, kingdoms, the southern and northern tribes, are in captivity. But then you hit the book of Ezra. And under Ezra, they come back into the land, and they rebuild the temple. Under Nehemiah, they come back and they rebuild the city. So you have the return of Israel back to the land where the temple is rebuilt. What happens in Esther? Well, one of the things in Esther is you have a power-hungry, accursed madman who tries to wipe the Jew from the face of the earth. The reason that guy's a curse, as I've told you before, he's an Ag Agagite. He is related to Agag. And he told him to, he said, God told him to wipe that crowd out, and when they didn't do it, one of the descendants of Agag is now trying to wipe out the Jews on three continents, from, from Egypt all the way to India. That's how many he was trying to kill. Three continents worth of Jews. Well, that's what the Antichrist is going to try to do. He's going to try to wipe out that Jew. And there are some other pictures there, but let's go on. After the book of Esther, what's the next book? Book of Job. Job, seven days on the ground. Seven days on the ground. Each day for a year of the tribulation. The, the book itself is 42 chapters long, representing 42 months of great tribulation. There's a difference between tribulation and great tribulation. So you have 42 months of great tribulation represented there. Do you know that there are, there are two creatures talked about in the book of Job? In Job chapter 40, it calls one behemoth. And in Job chapter 41, it calls one Leviathan. Behemoth is a beast. And Leviathan is a dragon. And you know what's so, so weird? When you go to the book of Revelation, you know what you have? You have a beast that draws his power from the dragon. Man, you are reading about it there in the book of Job of what's coming up. And there's going to be a beast, the Antichrist, that shows up. I don't know where these Christians are, man. I don't know what they're thinking, but that Bible is laid out premillennial. Because right after the book of Job, what do you have? The Messianic Psalms, where Jesus Christ comes back and sets up his kingdom. All you got to do is read Psalms too. He talks about, he says, kiss the king lest he be angry. But when he's down here, nobody's going to, uh, listen, you mess up, you're through. Now, I'm not talking about us, but the people of this world. Uh, Jesus Christ will be the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's always been that in heaven. He will be that here on earth. The kingdom of this world uh, will become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ. That's what the Revelation says. So you have, you have uh, right there in your Old Testament, a premillennial layout of what's going to happen in the future. Not a postmillennial, premillennial. But it also repeats itself in the New Testament. You have Matthew through Acts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Israel rejects their Messiah and they're dispersed. Then you've got Acts, or a good portion of Acts through Philemon where you have the church age. And guess what? A translation. A rapture. And then right after the book of Philemon, the last book of the Pauline epistles, what do you have? Hebrews, back to the Jew. And then you have... In Hebrews, through Revelation, you have, uh, going back to the Jew, you have the Great Tribulation, you have the Advent, you have the Kingdom, you have eternity. That's how it's laid out. I'm not making it up, am I? Don't let anybody talk you out. Of, listen, I didn't believe it because that man taught it. I believe it because it's the Bible. He taught me to believe the book. I'll tell you another reason why. Uh, the books uh, are uh, another reason why it's nonsense is because Israel is again the center of world history. Now, up until May the 14th, 1948, uh, they, may have had a, they may have had a point, but their point completely dissolved and went away <laughs> when that Jew became... If, if, listen, you have to just about do away with the Jew in, in, in this if you're going to hold on to post-millennial theology. Because if you believe the church is bringing it in, that means that Israel is not the one that's bringing it in. Or that Israel is not the focal point of it. So you've got to do away with all the promises. You know, 
The Bible says the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, the God of Abraham, kind of that's more representative of the Father. But we know the God of Isaac is representative of God the Son because Isaac took a bride of the Gentiles, just like he is calling out a bride today for his son. But Jacob, Jacob's name was changed to what? What are you going to do with that? I guess, oh, it's just the God of Abraham, God of, Abraham, God of Isaac. What are we going to say, God of Ishmael? We kicking out Jacob now? He made a promise to some people. No strings attached. He's going to fulfill that promise. You and I are not fulfilling that promise. We're not stepping into the place of the Jews in Scripture. Somebody does that. You know what they're trying to do? They're trying to do what Islam trying to do, what Catholicism is trying to do, what communism tried to do, and that's bring in their own kingdom. And when that starts happening, people die. I said the worst thing the church will do to its community around them is knock on their door Saturday morning early and wake them up and invite them to church. That's about the worst offense we'll do. We will kill nobody, steal from nobody, we don't hurt nobody, we'll take nothing from nobody. And if we do, we're wrong. But you start getting that kingdom stuff in your mind and you're going to bring one in, somebody's going to have to die. Listen, even when Jesus Christ comes back, he's stomping his enemies to death on the mountains of Megiddo. Better just believe that book, though. How in the world, if that's so, and Israel's not, if they're not uh, the focal point of history and of the future, if that's not so, then how is it that they survive what they survive for two millennia? Man, that Jew has, he has survived. Uh, I listed just a few things here. Or maybe I didn't. I think that he survived, well, the death camps. He survived pogroms throughout Eastern Europe. He survived um, the Spanish Inquisition, Inquisitions of Rome. Uh, he has survived being deported, uh, being exiled. I mean, 2,000 years. I, any people would have just faded into the world work and been gone, but not that Jew. He survived. You know why he survives? Because God says, he's not going away. Now, he may be under... He may be under some wrath. He may, be under, uh, he may be under the wrath of God for rejecting their Messiah, and he has been. And God may have allowed so many things to befall them, but listen, he still has a promise that he made to Abraham that he's got to fulfill. And he's going to fulfill it. You know how you know that? That Jew's still around. He's flying a flag over there. He's a nation now. How in the... How, 2,500 years has come... Uh, since... 2,500 years, 606 B.C., somewhere in there, when that Jew went into captivity, they were never a nation. They were never a nation, but now they are. Don't you see that that Bible is unfolding just like it says? You don't have to spiritually do anything with it. It says what it says. Don't let somebody talk you out of what that Bible teaches. I think they do it for the sake of convenience. Listen, you know what the last charge is? And I'll, I'm finishing up. The last charge is not to win the day. <laughs> We're not going to win the day. We are told to withstand the onslaught, not win the day. Listen, that day is coming when we will win the day, but it's not now. Ephesians 6.13 says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, why we're in a battle, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Doesn't talk about winning anything. Doesn't talk about conquering the world or the political system or, you know, turning nations to God. In Laodicea, that's not going to happen. He's talking about somebody withstanding, you know, maybe standing outside the door of a church and knocking. The message is hold the line, hold the fort. Stay the course. Keep the faith. That's the last charge. You say, why? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds 
to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's why we hold the line. Because He's coming. The Bible says that every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. That's a purifying doctrine. And they're trying to get rid of it. You need to hold on to it. Something else. And I'll close with this. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 to 5, it says this second epistle, Beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. Same kind of context. And guess what they're saying? Now, I realize this could be concerning the advent, but it also concerning the rapture. That is our second coming. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. You know, it used to be that the lost said that. Now the saved are saying it. Hey, now the Bible believers are beginning to say it. Keep saying it. Go on, keep saying it. Because the more you say it, the closer it gets. You know what it says in verse 5? For this, they willingly are ignorant. They're ignorant. They're ignorant of the scriptures and they're teaching a lie. So hold on. Hold on. You see, it just doesn't, I know how it looks, but I'm telling you it'll come through. You know, those disciples, when Jesus Christ was in that grave for three days, I, you know, they weren't sitting there saying, well, it's almost time for him to come up. Man, they were starting to lose faith and scatter and, and not knowing what to do, and, and the, uh, they were hiding themselves. Man, the women were the only ones out there. Where were the men? The men didn't show up till the women said, he's missing. <laughs> you know, that by, right up until that time, you'd have thought, I wonder if this is really going to happen. And then it happened. And what I'm telling you is, I know it may not look like it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. Because we've got a track record. <laughs> we've got a track record that runs nearly 6,000 years, and this thing ain't never been wrong. So hold on to your seats. All right, let's all stand.